Good afternoon, Atlanta Music Project young musicians and friends. I'm Averill and I'm happy to welcome you to another edition of AMP Online Masterclasses sponsored by the Chestnut Family Foundation. This class is New Heights, Developing Range Using the Harmonic Series for French Horn. This class is taught by Josh Williams. I invite you to participate by playing along at home and by answering questions in the chat and by asking questions in the chat. If you'd like, you can also have your video shown to demonstrate a concept as we go through the class. Also, if you don't already, please get your instrument out so that you can play along. So let's get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Josh Williams. I am the French horn teaching artist at Atlanta Music Project. I'm also a professional horn player. Been playing for about 15 years now. And in that time, I've been fortunate enough to really play all over the world. And um, thinking back to when I was in grade school, middle school, high school, uh, I was looking back on some concepts that really helped my horn playing long term. And I think the harmonic series is definitely one of those pivotal concepts that sort of launched my horn playing to the next level. So what is the harmonic series, you might be wondering. I'll save that for later on in the lecture, but it will be the main topic and everything ties into it. First, I want to talk about my inspiration for doing this class. Um, and it takes me back way to seventh grade, which was um, a lot longer ago than I'd like to admit. Um, I, was, I was in middle school band, taking lessons as my first year. And I remember just looking at my music, having notes that were too low or notes that were too high. You know, at the time I was pretty advanced, so I, I worked ahead in my book. But as I got further into the book and into the, the next book, um, our Essential Elements books, I noticed, you know, these notes are way too high. Some of the notes are way too low. And I got by at the time by doing a lot of things wrong and developing a lot of bad habits. And, you know, as musicians, if we develop bad habits, it follows us you know, down the line years and uh, maybe to the point where you don't notice it until it's maybe too late. So I think this is a great topic for young musicians. You're all at an age where I think if this is introduced to you now, it gives you a, a really, really big advantage later on. Um, I didn't learn a lot of this certainly in, until about college. So it wasn't until I understood, understood sort of how the horn works. You see, there's a lot of tubing. It's a very complex instrument, flared bell. Um, that's really when it started to take off. So what I will say, this is not an um, all-inclusive guide to developing your range, but it's a resource that you should implement into consistent and daily practice. So you'll find that this masterclass is educational, but also interactive. We'll do a lot of playing. Um, we'll do a lot of demonstrations. You'll hear me play a lot, and you all have plenty of opportunities to play as well. So why focus on range? Uh, it's simply because the horn has a very, very, very large range, um, well over four octaves. If we think about a piano, if you were to slide your finger across a piano a keyboard, four octaves, you'd be going for a long time. And we can do that on just this one instrument here. And so I know we have a, a chart here that will display the practical range of the horn. And you'll see that it's quite wide. So if we look at that, it starts way down in, in the bass clef. So many of you have probably seen a bass clef before. If you haven't, as horn players, we do read in both treble and bass clef. Uh, if you see the two dots on the fourth line of the bass clef, that shows us um, where F is. So if we go down, we see our first note is low F. And that note, way down in the basement, sounds like this. So as you can tell, it's a really low note, almost sounds a little funny at times, but that's our low F. And as we keep going up, we get to low C. Now, if we skip down a line, it says high horn range starts here. That's where we get to the treble clef. We get on G. Keep going up. So 
all the way up to high C, and that's sort of where the practical range for the horn ends. So if we were to do that all very quickly, it sounds sort of like this. So that's a lot of notes, right? And so that's why I sort of chose to focus on range. We have all these notes and you know, you're all very young and you have a lot being thrown at you, a lot more than uh, your friends who play other instruments actually at times. And so I have some musical examples today. Uh, we'll take a look at those later on. But uh, one thing I want to talk about real quick is that the picture that you just saw actually doesn't even showcase the entire range of the horn. You can go down below the low F that I played. And you can actually go well above the high C at the top. Um, and so a lot of notes, you can really tell there's a lot of notes there. Um, so one thing right now I think would be fun is if we have maybe some of our participants showcase their range just by uh, giving us an example of their lowest note that they can play right now and um, maybe the highest note that they get up to. Now, it's going to be different day to day, but I think it's a fun way to sort of get active here at the beginning of the master class. Outstanding, outstanding. So we are bringing Ray on on screen and we're also bringing um, Aiden on screen. Um, so let's start with Rayhan. Hello. Hey, hey. Rayhan, thank you for tuning in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice to be here. Great to have you. Okay. All right, so Rayhan, if you could. Uh, just demonstrate for us maybe the lowest note that you can get down to. Okay, that's my lowest. Good, so that's around low F, which is yeah. about an octave above the, the low F here on the chart. And so that, that's, that's a pretty good place, especially starting out um, playing as long as you have. Uh, give us an example of a high note. So there's a high A that's way up above the treble clef staff. We have high A, you can see that on the fourth line on the chart there. And so he played uh, really a lot of uh, a pretty wide range there from low F all the way up to high A, and it still doesn't encompass the full range of the horn. So uh, that's just a point that I wanted to make very early on here in the master class. Um, so you can really argue that the horn is one of the more difficult instruments because we're responsible for so many notes. And it wasn't always this way. It's really just um, a result of the development of the instrument. So uh, back in the 17th century, when the horn became an orchestral instrument, we had what we now call a natural horn. And we'll show you a, a picture of that here. Um, and it's essentially, it looks like a regular horn, except it doesn't have the tubing in the middle. It's uh, just wound metal and a flared bell. So if you see right there on the left side of the screen, it has uh, more or less a natural horn, but even maybe without that tubing in the middle. And on the right side, you have um, what looks like to be a triple horn. You have much more tubing um, and a lot more advantages and um, flexibility with that. And so we started out with our horns without all of the tubing. And so we were only able to play a certain number of notes and we'll get into why. But with that in mind, composers wrote for two to four horns in the orchestra because uh, since we have to cover such a large range, the high horn or the first horn would play the upper notes and the second horn would play the lower notes. And that's why our parts are sort of like that, where the first horn is higher and the second horn is lower. Now, when writing for four horns, at times, we'd have first and second, high and low, and then we have third horn and fourth horn, which sort of act as the same pair. The third horn plays higher notes, and the fourth horn plays lower notes. So this led to what we call uh, specializing. Um, you may have heard it before where horn players will say, you know, I'm a high horn player or I'm a low horn player. And it's a tradition that we follow to this day. 
even in professional orchestras, um, you have a particular role. If you're the principal horn, you'll always play first horn. If you're second horn, you'll always play second horn or the lower parts. Uh, but as the music has developed over the years, you'll find that even second and fourth horn players have to play the high notes. And the first and third horn players still have to play the lower notes. So uh, thinking back on the natural horn, without all the tubing in the middle, just the wound tubing and the flared bell. One other thing that you saw missing from the picture was the valves. We have these here. Um, and you might be thinking to yourselves, how do I play the horn without valves? Uh, does anyone have an answer to that question? Perhaps in the gallery. So let's throw this out to, um, to everyone. Um, uh, so Rayhan or um, Aiden, do you guys have any answers? And then also to um, the people that are out in the audience, you can enter the answer into the chat. Um, how about um, Aiden? You want to give a stab? Um, Airspeed and tone quality you can change the notes. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, you can change the note with uh, your airspeed. That's a good way of thinking about it. And tone quality, uh, changing the, the pitch of the note, right. So if I play my horn right now with no valves pressed down, I have only a few notes I can play. Let me try to play a scale without valves. You see, I already can't. So um, horn players back in the 17th century uh, developed something called hand horn technique. And this is where they could play the notes that weren't available to them without their valves to get a few more notes. So you have. A popular example of that in a popular horn player was uh, Giovanni Punto, who um, he was a soloist. He's very, very popular and famous at the time. And he actually went around and showed a lot of other horn players how to implement this technique. And a popular example of that occurs in the Beethoven Sonata for Horn and Piano. And Punto actually premiered this piece. And the piece has a really iconic opening. If you're a horn player, you've probably heard it on the internet or something, but it sounds like this. And so on the next part, we have notes that we can't play without valves, so we use hand horn technique. I'll do that again. With valves, it sounds like this. It's a lot easier with valves, right? And also with the hand horn technique, it changes the timbre of the note. If you listen to this. It gets almost a muffled or a, a nasally sound. And so um, I want to talk about doing that because actually the harmonic series kind of ties into playing stop horn. We know a stop horn now. And it sounds like this. Now, we may be familiar with mutes that create a certain sound, but stopped horn creates um, a really piercing nasally sound. You see it a lot in uh, Mahler symphonies and a lot of modern music. And so the way that we do this is we use our regular hand position, which should look like uh, you're shaking a hand, except your thumb is up here directly into the bell. Now, in order to stop it, you seal off the bell by just moving your palm down to create that seal. Sounds like this. And also like this. So um, Aiden, if you will, since you're, you're on screen here, how about you give us an example of a stop note with that in mind? Just give it a try. Right, exactly right. Now play it uh, without stopping the horn. Right, 
Okay. And so we see that the pitches are a little bit different and um, it's because, well, when we get to the harmonic series, we'll find that when we stop the horn, we're changing the fundamental harmonic. But again, I'm going to delay any talk about the harmonic series before we get the other uh, things addressed. Here's your mark, Mr. Josh. All right. So this is a good time now to look at some musical examples. Um, as we go on in time, we get the invention of the valve around 1815 with the Industrial Revolution. And so at this time, composers started to write parts that ventured well beyond their normal um, limits. So first horn parts got a lot lower, second and fourth horn parts got a lot higher. And so we have some musical examples here and wanted to demonstrate some of these just to show you sort of the evolution of horn playing over time. So again, around this time, um, composers knew that horn players had access to valves, so there are a lot more chromatic notes, um, the notes that we normally would have to use hand horn technique to play. Sorry about that, Mr. Josh. Give me just a sec, and um, okay. maybe if you continue, I'll, I'll get it in just a second. Okay. So uh, one of the first examples I wanted to look at was um, a part in the horn rep now from Mahler's First Symphony, and it is from the third movement of that piece. And it's entirely in bass clef, which if we look at our orchestra music or band music that we play at school, or just um, in, our, in our spare time, we usually don't play a lot of music that's exclusively in bass clef. But again, as we get the vowels, we have access to more notes. And so uh, we have the ability to play certain lines. And I'll demonstrate uh, just how low this line is. It starts on B flat in the bass clef. And that's this note here. So that's just a little bit of it. It's a snippet of it. If we keep going, and there, there's the example right there. As you can see, this is a duet between first and second horn. If we look down at the second horn line, we're in bass clef, we're way down there. So again, I'll, I'll play a little bit of that for you. So there we have uh, what we call the money note. It's a, a pedal F, which is the same sort of low note that we looked at in our very first range chart. So that's an example of some of the lower parts that we started to see. It started to venture way down there to the, uh, the, the basement of horn playing. And just a fun fact, you actually need to have a double horn to play this line because uh, the single F horn actually stops one half step above that low F chart. You can't play that note on a single horn. So this is definitely as the uh, horn became a lot more developed as an instrument. So let's look at some more examples here. 
Um, another one that I want to look at is from Siegfried's Rhine Journey, which is a piece by Bogner, um, of a much greater work um, called The Ring Cycle. And um, this is a very heroic horn solo. You hear it a lot at horn auditions, especially first horn auditions. And it's a lot higher, uh, more heroic. And it focuses exclusively sort of on the, the high range of the horn. So a little bit of that. I'll play a little bit for you while we're uh, getting it set up. So yeah, as you can tell, it's, it's all really high. And that's perfect right there. That's our last example from Till Eulenspiegel. And, um, or was there? there? There it is. So if we look at on the left side, or on the right side, actually, that was the Wagner Siegfried's Rhine Journey. Take a look at the last notes, high C. So you're way up there, um, generally at the max of the horn register that you will mostly have to play in most music. So if you go over to the left side of the screen here, we have Till Eulenspiegel, a piece by Strauss, a tone poem by Strauss. And this is where we have sort of a combination of what you just heard. We have high horn playing and low horn playing all in the same excerpt. So let's just take a look at it and study it. We have starting on second line G, we go all the way up if you look on the second line of the excerpt to high A, which is way up there. And then we get a bass clef, the very next measure, taking us down to low C. So that is almost three octaves of range in one excerpt. And it happens really fast. So you really have to have your range developed, which is, again, the whole topic of this. And so when we start talking about the harmonic series, it focuses on playing lines like this, which will make you a better horn player. So an example of this excerpt, So you see it happens really fast you're playing up in the in the high register and then jumping down to the low register and it takes a long time to develop that skill but again this is just an example of how uh, rep changes over time. So this is standard orchestral rep. This is nothing out of the ordinary. As we move on into modern music, we have music written for horn choir and horn solo music, and it really pushes the envelope a lot more. We get pieces that go well above high C. We get pieces that go down all the way to pedal C below low F. So, uh, Again, we have a lot of notes that we're responsible for, so that's the point that I just want to keep driving home. So now let's talk about the harmonic series. It finally leads us there after all of that. The harmonic series, the most simple definition I can think of is it's the fundamental set of notes that can be played on your instrument. If we want to break that down even more, we could say that it's the fundamental set of notes that can be played on a particular valve combination. So, and I like to think of it that way because we no longer play on natural horns. We have really what is a combination of a bunch of horns in one. And this sort of harmonic series shows you that. So if we look at the top, it says F slash B flat harmonic series. So that just simply means your F horn, which is your horn without the trigger down if you play a double horn. And B flat means playing your horn with the trigger down uh, if you do play an F B flat double horn. So for now, just to make sure uh, everyone's included for the most part, let's skip down to line six, which is measure 21. And this is the F zero. That means that you're playing on the F side of your horn, which means no valves down zero again no valves and this is a horn in f sometimes called f horn 
So a lot of times we get that confused and we think F stands for French. Um, no, that means that your horn, the fundamental harmonic of your horn is concert F. So if we take a look at this harmonic series, we have harmonic one, which is pedal C, a very, very low note. Harmonic two is our low C that you just heard in the Till Euland Spiegel excerpt. And then after that, as we keep going up, we have harmonic three, which is low G. Now we're starting to enter the high horn range according to our range chart. Then we have harmonic four, which is middle C. So you see it extends all the way up to harmonic 16, which is high C. So looking at the range here and uh, the spacing between the notes, what's something that you all notice as you ascend with the harmonic series? Let's throw this one to... Um, what was the question? So as we ascend in the harmonic series, um, if you think about the relationship between the notes, what do you notice? Or what are some of your observations, other than the fact that it gets higher? Um, there's different key changes, as in like some notes are flat, some notes are sharp. Like, yeah, that, that's good. Okay, what else? What do you think, um, what do you think, Aiden? The clef changes. Clef does change. Yeah, uh, clef changes. So these are all true. The clef changes. We get some notes that are, you know, accidentals. Uh, we don't want to think of it that way because they all belong to the F harmonic series. None of these notes are wrong notes. Um, now in the key of F, yes, maybe these notes, some of these notes are incorrect, but in the F harmonic series, these all belong to it. So what you notice is that the gap between the notes is a lot bigger. The spacing between the notes is a lot bigger when you're lower in the harmonic series. So if you take a look at harmonics one to two, and as we see the harmonic is below the note, so there's one and two, that's pedal C to low C, that's an entire octave. And then you look, you have low C to low G. You go up a fifth and then G, low G to middle C, three to four. You have a perfect fourth. Then you have C to E, which is a third. And as you keep going up, we get mostly thirds and seconds until let's look at harmonic 12 here, which is high G. We go up a half step and then a whole step and then a half step. So the spacing between the notes gets a lot less wide, which is why it's harder to hit the high notes. Because if you think about it, when we play a horn, we take a breath, our lips vibrate and we have to sort of voice the note using a lot of different factors that we'll talk about um, later on here in the, in the class. And so um, as we get higher up, that's why it's harder to hit notes because your target is a lot smaller. So it's sort of like if you're doing archery and you want to hit the bullseye, let's think of the bullseye as a high C and let's think of the outer circles or outer rim of the target as the lower notes, They're a lot easier to hit, okay? So with that in mind, let's talk about why we have all these different valve combinations. So it goes back to our whole talk about the natural horn and how the natural horn has um, no valves and you can only play the notes within the harmonic series. And you have to use hand horn. Well, obviously we want all of our notes to sound the same without the nasal quality of hand horn technique. So we have these different valves so we can play certain notes. So when notes change from high to low, we're actually changing the um, length of the horn. So for example, if we have to play that, I'm changing the length of the horn. So the length of the, the horn is changing this entire time. And this is why when you're in orchestra or in band, if you're, if you're sharp, your director will say, pull out on your tuning slides. Because if we pull out our tuning slides here, let's say my tuning slides are all the way pushed in, I make my instrument longer 
by pulling the slides out. Therefore, the pitch of the note gets lower. So it's the same thing when you switch valve combinations. And if we look, starting at measure 21, and if we go down a line, slowly down the, the page, we start with the F harmonic series. I'm pulling it back up, um, mark two as I do that. Okay. So as we go down, the link changes. So again, measure 21 top of the page. We have, let's start on harmonic four. Let's just look at harmonic four on each line. So we have C. If we jump down to the next harmonic series, which is F2, which means second valve, no trigger. It's going to be B. So it's lower. So what happens to the length of the instrument when we go from C down to B? Can someone tell us that? It gets longer. Yeah, it gets longer. Okay, now let's look. If we go from B down to B flat, so F1, what happens then? You said B to B flat. Right. That's right, B down to B flat. It gets, it gets, it still get longer, please. Right, so you're adding length to your instrument as you go down. So here's a question for everyone, really. If we have an F natural horn, so horn in F, and we have it sitting next to a, let's say an E horn, horn in E, which natural horn is going to have more tubing or be a longer instrument? It would be the E, right? Because it's, it's lower. So we had things called crooks that you put on the instrument to add length. So if you're playing a C horn way down there, it's going to be some of the longest tubing that you have on an instrument. But fortunately for us, we don't actually see that change in tubing on our actual horns. So another thing, uh, another good reason to know that is because, especially on double horns, and I know that uh, Rayhan and Aiden, you both play on double horns. So we'll focus on that for now. If we add the trigger, we get a different set of notes. But we always ask ourselves, why can I play certain notes with the same fingering? And it's because you found a different combination to different valve combination that results in the same length of tubing. So for example, let's have someone play um, any note of their choosing and then we'll find an alternate fingering. All right, looks like Aiden's uh, volunteering. So Aiden, why don't you play uh, an A for us? So second space A. So a little bit higher. So let's do it on the uh, double horn. So trigger one, two. Good. Now I'll do trigger three and play the same note. Yeah, so that's an example there of how we have the same length of tubing, but just a different valve combination. So again, uh, and we think about it this way, we have horn with no valves, it's horn and F. You don't want to start thinking of it as when I press the second valve down, I now have an E horn. Um, really, we're, we're transposing a lot on the fly without really realizing it, which is why I always think it's, it's really cool to, to see brass players kind of do that because that's what we do every time we press on a different valve. We're really transposing. We just don't actually notice the change there. Okay, so... Let's focus on line six again, which is the F harmonic series. And the big question here is why do we use this to develop range? Um, one, it's because you can't force the harmonic series. And I'll give you some good examples of this. And I have a lot of personal experience. Um, and the other thing is you can build your horn playing from the inside out. If you ever have any problems playing in the upper register or in the lower register, it's usually because something in between isn't quite working right. So again, let's look at the top line, measure 21. And the inside out method, which is what I recommend, start on harmonic four in every single harmonic series, because this is going to give you the easiest starting point. So right here, first one you have, that's harmonic four. And my method is the four through eight method. And then you work your way up and down from there. So, and I, I like to start by slurring because I usually do this in my warm-up. 
So you have yeah, four through eight sounds like this. Again, that is. And if we tongue it. And I'll do it slower one last time. So I'll show you a, a bad example of that. This is what happens when you try to force it. And can we, do you think, Mr. Josh, we could get um, the, the foreign students to demonstrate as well and see how well they can do and what they may need to adjust on with these exercises? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, but first, I, uh, one thing that I should say before we, we try it is just don't force it, because here's what happens when you do. Mm -hmm. sort of want to ride the air up. So yeah, let's get a couple of volunteers. Let's just have everyone play it and um, do it at your own tempo. You can do it slurred or tongued, but do it at a consistent tempo. And you can, um, oops, sorry guys. You can also practice um, and get it together while you're, while someone is playing, just be on mute. So, um, all right, go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, so let's start with let's start with Aiden. Let's do the C harmonic series. In your first note, harmonic four. And again, this is no valves pressed down, just open, no trigger. So I go from the lowest C I can play to the highest one. Um, no, but here on the sheet, look, we're going to go from harmonic four up to harmonic eight. So the notes you're going to play. C, E, G, B flat, C, but all in the same valve combination. Okay. Good. Let's do that again. So one thing I want to note, and I'm glad this happened, when you got to harmonic number seven, the B flat, you notice it sounded a little weird, right? If we look below the note, we have these minus signs or plus signs. This is showing the frequency of the note, so uh, the tuning of the note, essentially the pitch. So that B flat is actually 30 cents flat, and it's supposed to sound like that. So if we're playing a B flat chord, and you want to sort of be a cheeky horn player and play an alternate finger for B, fingering for B-flat and play it open, it'll be way too low. So uh, just keep that in mind when you get to harmonic number seven. And there's actually uh, there's a good use for seventh harmonics, and I may talk about it later if we have time for it. But all right, let's move on to Rehan. <laughs> Okay, excellent. So let's do that again. Good. So uh, you're, you're familiar with this whole approach. So he kind of beat me to the punch here. Um, you use this method to sort of expand upward and downward because we're starting in our comfort zone. And we're also starting um, sort of in the most optimal range for the horn. So think about these harmonics as sort of nodal points on the horn. If you ever hit a harmonic and it doesn't sound right, that means your horn isn't vibrating correctly. And the question for you all is how do you get the horn to vibrate at the correct frequency? It's a weird question, but how do we get the horn to, to resonate and really make the most beautiful sound possible? Fix your armature. Yeah, it's all really in the armature in the air. 
and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the embouchure is what gets lips to vibrate. And if you can put the screen on uh, for a second, your embouchure, if it doesn't vibrate, you won't get a note. So always keep that in mind. If it's not vibrating correctly, sometimes what we do is we use lip tension to make it happen. And here's an example. Here's a bad embouchure placement. I'm using all, I'm just using lips to do that. So what you want to do is use your core, which is going to be your lower abdominal muscles. Use your air. Good buzz. So um, that's, that's one thing to focus on. So now let's work on ascending above. We'll stick with the, the F harmonic series. And as we approach the, the last um, few minutes of the webinar, I just want to encourage anyone out there that may have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll relay them to uh, Mr. Josh. All right, go ahead, Mr. Josh. Excellent. And we, we're at the 15 minute mark? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So as we ascend, you want to think about a couple of things. You want the tongue placement to be high in the mouth as if you're whistling. You want to take a good breath and you want the corners of your armature to be down and firm. As we play lower, you want the jaw to drop and I'll show you an example. You see how this sort of drops? You want the tongue placement to be lower and you want to think of O vowel. So the last thing I want to close out with, because I think this is a, just a really good analogy. Uh, some things to think about, again, don't force it. Ride the air up and down. And the last one, uh, this is inspired by Bill Vermeulen, who's the principal of the Houston Symphony. I sort of added on to his idea. You want to think of your horn as a car. So we all have different cars. They get us from point A to point C. You may have a luxury sports car or a beat up car, but it's going to get you somewhere if you're using it the right way. Your mouthpiece is the key. You can't start your car without the keys. Your embouchure is the starter. If your starter is bad, your car won't start up. If your lips don't vibrate, the note doesn't start. The air is the gas. So how much air do you have? Do you have enough to get to the grocery store or enough for a road trip across the country? So those things all have to be working correctly. So um, again, what I must say, this is not meant to be used strictly as a warm up. It's part of a consistent routine. And you want to slowly work your way up using the inside out method. So four to eight, which is, and add some on. Let's say I'm going to get to harmonic 12 this week. And then, and sort of work your way down. Okay, and you can do that with all the different harmonic series on this chart, which I highly recommend getting. It's available online, it has the fingering for each one. And so it's a good way to work on your range because otherwise we get a low note, we just do this. We don't really know what the target is. So this helps us kind of guide our way to that note. So um, I guess we'll close with any questions that we have right now. Or... Um, nothing is in the chat, but I wonder if Rayhan or Aiden, do you all have any questions um, about about your range, about developing the range on the horn, about the harmonic series, um, or about horn playing in general? Um, I don't right now. No. Okay, okay. okay good. Well, Mr. Josh, are there, are there any things that you would want to leave them with if you, would, if, if you were to summarize um, the most important things of your presentation with the last um, minute or so that we have? Um, what would you tell our horn players out there? Yeah, um, it really just comes down to a couple of things. The embouchure, the air, and the tongue placement. The tongue has to be higher in the mouth for a higher note, lower in the mouth for a low note. You need air all the time. You have to take a, a good, efficient breath and make sure you're getting a good buzz. And you can always practice buzzing on just the mouthpiece. You can't play a note, take your mouthpiece off and buzz it. If you still can't play it, then you need to go back and assess and again work from inside out.
Um, and then the last thing is just work slowly with this. This is something that um, you don't want to go too fast at. Uh, you really want to make sure that you're, you're doing it the right way uh, with as little tension in the lips as possible. Don't force the harmonics to come out. Naturally go with the horn as you hit the nodal points. The horn will ring. You'll, you'll hear it when you're doing it really quickly. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, and we hope that you all have a wonderful day. And thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, anytime. Thanks.